So before the recording, I refer to trigonometric substitution as tricksy. In one sense, it's actually extremely mechanical. If you see something that looks like this, try doing this. But there are a lot of steps, and it sometimes can seem, especially as it's presented in the textbook, as if it's being done using magic, like the magician pulls a card out and it's the right card, and it's how did that happen? So let's try to provide some kind of idea. Um, when I was talking about inverse trig functions, I made the observation that some integrals and some combinations of square roots look like they come from right triangles. So here's an integral that we don't need any special trick to take or at least we don't need any new special take trick to take. <laughs> it's an inverse trig function problem. But let's take a look at that square root in the denominator. That square root is something that would happen if we had an x and a three, then this would be the square root of nine minus x squared on a right triangle. And that's using the Pythagorean theorem. So the idea of trigonometric substitution is, suppose we couldn't take that just using an inverse trig function. Um, suppose we saw a square root like that out in the wild and we didn't know how to proceed. Well, we could observe that this looks like it comes from a right triangle. And then we could ask, well, what can we do with right triangles? We can use the Pythagorean theorem. We've kind of already done that. I mean, the fact that if this is x and this is 3, then this is the square root comes from the Pythagorean theorem. So what else could we do? Well, trigonometry, we could define an angle, and then we could take the cosine of the angle, the sine of the angle, the tangent, the secant, this is another situation where we're going to use uh, trig functions that are different from the most famous three. And our goal is going to be to replace what's under the square root with a trig function. And when I say that, it sounds like we're absolutely going to be making this problem worse instead of better because trig functions are complicated. And why would you want to do that? But our specific goal, more specifically, is going to be to replace what's under the square root with a power of a trig function, something like the sine squared or the secant squared. It's not going to end up being this. This is just an example. But if we could replace what's under the square root with a sine squared, then we could let the square root and the sine, or 
a tangent squared or a secant squared or a cosine squared or any trig function squared, then the square root would go away. And then we maybe have something we could deal with because trig functions are difficult to work with, but square roots are also difficult to work with. So the hope is that by getting rid of the square root, we'll be able to proceed with the problem. So now that we've <laughs> Now that we've stated what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it, this whole thing might be somewhat less random. Our, fun our next goal should be to get x equal was some kind of trig function. So we can take that value of x and plug it into the integral, and hopefully we'll get the square root of the square that we're looking for, and things will work out. So there are six trig functions but we, uh, we certainly don't want, I mean, our whole goal is to get rid of that messy square root. So we certainly don't want anything that involves it. Leaving us with the opposite side and the hypotenuse. to relate the angle to the opposite side and the hypotenuse. It's the sine. The sine of theta is x over three. Three times the sine of theta equals x. And now we can take this and we can plug it in here. And remember that our goal was to get a trig function squared. So we're in a good place here. We've got x is a trig function. And we've got an x squared under the square root. So doing this is going to give us a trig function squared. It's also going to give us a nine. So there will be some work to do. But we are at least seem to be on a path that might take us somewhere. Now, this is kind of different. I mean, it's very different from U substitution, but one fact from U substitution remains that you can't have your variable be theta and then have a dx there. Just like when you did U substitution, you had to turn your dx into a du, here we have to turn our dx into a d theta. Well, good news. This is going to work exactly how it worked in trig subs in um, u substitution, which is also how it works in integration by parts. Or if we wanted du, we just took a derivative and then whacked a dx on the end. The derivative of three times the cosine theta times the sine of theta is three times the cosine theta 
d theta equals dx. And now, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, these two substitution problems tend to go on a bit. So, sorry about that, but there's not really anything that can be done about it. Um, we've got the integral of 1 over the square root of 9 minus x squared, but x is this, 9 minus 9 times the sine squared theta. So that's 9 minus x squared. And then dx is 3 times the cosine of theta d theta. And again, I mean, it's always, again, speaking sort of like magicians and magic tricks, it always kind of looks at the middle as if we've done, we're doing something impossible, like there is no way we're going to be able to integrate that. We've made it so much harder than it was to begin with. But when the dust clears, the, the string that the magician cut will indeed be uh, one piece again. The trick we use here is always the same when we're doing u substitution. It's to use the Pythagorean identity to get rid of the square root. If we do trigonometric substitution right, and I know at this point we're in our first example, it's not clear totally what that means. But if we do trig substitution right, we'll always get something under the square root. that we're able to simplify. We'll always be able to get rid of the square root. Now, it's perfectly possible that you get rid of the square root and still can't take the integral. Um, this is going to become repetitive, but um, me saying this, but there's no, you know, one size fits all magic solutions in this class. But we'll always be able to get rid of a square root. And let me just shot up here what we're doing. If we rewrite the Pythagorean identity a little, we get that one minus the sine squared is the cosine squared. And the product of a square root is the square root of the product. Well, I'll write it, but then I'll just erase it. So the product of the square root is the square root of the product. We can break this up. And then we can use the Pythagorean identity 
Earth. Replace that thing under the square root with a cosine squared. And there are some details that for the moment, I'm just going to wave my hand over. The square root of the cosine squared <clears throat> isn't actually, um, the square root and the cosine don't actually cancel each other out. What we should get is an absolute value. But um, for technical reasons that I'm not going to get into, are not going to worry about that here. The square root of nine is three. The square and the square root cancel each other out. And the magic trick has worked. Now, this three and this three and this cosine and this cosine all cancel each other out. And from the, what looked like this absolute disaster, we somehow got a really nice integral that we can take. The integral of one is theta. And then, um, as with u substitution, we got a variable other than our original variable. We got a theta. As with u substitution, we need to go back to our original variable. In u substitution, it's easy. You have something like, you know, whatever you have, and then you are told that you, I mean, as part of the U substitution, you wrote down what U equals, and you just plug it back in. With trigonometric substitution, it can be trickier. You see, nowhere on this board do I have a statement, theta equals something. In this particular case, though, I can the the very material I'm teaching to my trig class this uh, this week. We can find that theta is an arc side. And this works. Um, that is to say, if you remember from trig, you might think, well, but aren't there, there are complications, right? This is only true if x over three is falling inside a certain range. It's only true if, if it's between negative pi over two and positive pi over two which I say you're right, but none of those complications arise here. We can just take the arc side. A lot of work to get an integral that we already knew and could have taken using the chapter seven inverse trig stuff. But I thought, I mean, it's always good to start with 
simple examples, and sadly there aren't any simple examples with the in with this stuff. I mean, I wouldn't call this simple, but simplest. This is about as simple as you can get. So it's the example we started, we chose to start with even though we could have done it another way. So, I mean, there are probably that may be kind of a higher level question. It's like, how did I know to use the sine instead of the cosecant? Or what if I did use another trig function sort of the, the kind of pedagogical, but how do you know how to do that kind of question? Just on a purely mechanical, going from one equation to another equation to another equation until we reach the end of the problem level. Does anybody have any questions? about the material or about the problem we just did. Then inverse trig functions, there are three inverse, what am I saying? Trig substitution. There are three classic trigonometric substitutions. And trigonometric substitutions, again, they're messy, they can be difficult, but in partial compensation for this, they are very, you know, if you see this, try this. They're very mechanical. So we've just seen an example of the first substitution. If you see the square root of a squared minus x squared, we might try letting x be a times the sine of theta. And I'm now going to sort of walk back something I said. I do want to remind you that there are no absolute rules in calc to this, especially, you know, If you had this, you might try substitution, trig substitution, or you might spare yourself a lot of grief by doing something else, by doing U substitution. So I always kind of think of trig substitution as a how should I put this? A final thing to try before I just give up and go to a computer. Because it is, I mean, it is so messy. I don't think it's ever going to be anyone's first choice if there are alternatives. But Maybe there won't be alternatives. So let's do a second example. Uh, let me. So here we have a squared. That's, and in the example we just did, a was three. We had nine. It was a perfect square. But any number, any positive number, I should say, 
can be thought of as a square. So if we saw the square root of seven minus x squared, we could try letting x be the square root of seven times the sine of theta. And the thing or a thing about trigonometric substitutions, it's not enough just to know the substitution. You have to know a triangle. And that didn't end up being an issue here, I wrote down a right try. Well, it did. I mean, we needed. So you might say, well, I wrote down the triangle, but I only did that so that I'd know that the sine of theta was x over 3. And now we have this mechanical way of doing this. So we no longer need to write down the triangle to figure out that X is A times the sine of theta. But that's, um, that ends up being a false argument. You ought to know this picture that you've got X here, A here, and this messy square root down here. And looking ahead a bit, the reason you need to know that triangle is that very frequently when we do trig substitution, we wind up with trig functions that are different from what we started with. Like we might do a um, trig substitution and our answer might have the cosine of theta in it. And then in this very last step where we have to get rid of thetas, how can we get rid of the cosine of theta? We can't use the inverse trig function like we do here, but if we have this like we did here, but if we have this triangle in our mind, we can say, oh yeah, cosine of theta, that's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So we want the substitution, but we also want the triangle. And with those uh, preliminary observations out of the way, let's try to do a problem. And hopefully be able to get through to the end. But trig substitutions are lengthy, so we'll see. It took th about 30, uh, 20 minutes to do the first one. So this, this is a messier integral. Um, we can't use U substitution. That's always going to be my first thought when we have X's inside a square root and X's outside a square root. My first thought's never gonna be trig substitution. My first thought's always going to be this. Sadly, it doesn't work as you see if we had If I erase that and we just had an X up there, this would work. We'd put in the negative two and we'd spare ourselves a lot of hassle, but we have the problem we have and that's not going to work. 
And certainly this doesn't look like integration by par. So I mean, I don't, we don't really have a product we have a quotient. I have no idea how parts would help us here. It's not, you know, just powers of trig functions. And it doesn't look like an inverse trig function. So there's no hope for it. So nine is three squared. Here's X. Here's the square root. And the U substitution we do, not U substitution, trig substitution. The trig substitution we should do, trying to follow the guidance on this frame. Well, it's the same trig substitution we did in the last example because I didn't change the square root. I just complicated the rest of the integral. So dx will still be three times the cosine of theta d theta. And let's see what we can do. And I'm certainly not going to rush through this, but since we did already work with the square root of nine minus x squared here, and we saw that it turns into three times the cosine, I might go a little faster. But we've got three times the sine of theta cubed. In the denominator, we've got nine minus nine times the sine squared of theta. Dx is again, three times the cosine of theta. The nines pull out. We really ought to be writing these d thetas. It can be easy to get sloppy when you're like doing a 10 R problem. Um, any questions about why the nine pulled out and turned to three? Then the Pythagorean identity once again tells us that we've got the cosine squared of theta. And in the next frame, okay, nine times the sine cubed of theta over the square root of the cosine squared will be the cosine. Three times the cosine theta, d theta is again three times the cosine. And unlike in the first, problem, which was lab grown to work out nicely. I mean, we still get some cancellation. 
But instead of just getting theta, which was, or rather, instead of just getting one, which was nice, and its integral was just theta, we get nine times the sine cubed of theta. Okay. So what should I do now? We split it up and make it sine squared times sine, and then do it that way. Exactly correct. This is an odd power of the sine. We know how to deal with odd powers of the sine. So we're going to, to use the Pythagorean identity again. Um, the sine squared, you know, if it were the sine to the eighth, you'd write it as the sine squared to the fourth, but we don't need to do that step here. We've just got the sine squared. We hit it with the Pythagorean identity. Do not make the error I just made where I forgot to copy down this necessary sign. And now we're pretty golden, um, as golden as we can be in a problem like this when we have these odd powers, it turns into U substitution. Uh, we're missing the negative sign. We've reached the point where I'm not going to recopy the entire thing just to put in a missing constant. We'll put it in and then we'll put the negative another negative sign in to cancel out. We've got negative nine times the integral of one minus u squared du. All right, so the integral of one is u, the integral of u squared is one cubed, one third u cubed, and then you've got a plus c, a constant of integration. U, was the cosine. So negative nine times the cosine of theta minus three times the cosine cubed of theta plus C. But we don't want theta. Theta isn't our variable. Theta is just some fake thing that we made up so we'd be able to get rid of the square root. And maybe all of that kind of explanation about why we want to um, draw this triangle could have just been saved because now we're seeing it in action. We have the cosine 
of theta. We want x's, well, very fortunately, we have that triangle that's going to let us replace the cosine of theta with x's. The cosine of theta is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So, negative nine times the cosine of theta times the square root of nine minus x squared over three. minus three times the cosine of theta raised to the third power plus a constant of integration. And there are little simplifications you could do. Probably, you know, negative nine times a third. Probably you want to turn that into a negative three. Similarly here, we've got this cubed. This is 27. So negative three over 27 will give us a nine. And I guess it's always kind of unappealing to have a square root raised to a cubed power. It maybe looks a little nicer if I put it in parentheses. Or I guess you could rewrite it, if you prefer, as a power. The square root cubed is the three halves power. Or just leave it. I mean, some simplification is always to the best, but we don't want to, to go crazy and waste our time. So that's... Our second example of a substitution, it is, I mean, hard as it might be to believe, it's a relatively nice example because, you know, it worked. We were able to take, um, take the integral in the end. If instead of x cubed, we'd had x to the one cubed. You know, everything would have worked to a point. We would have gotten rid of the square root, but then we'd have wound up with the cubed root of the sine, and we wouldn't have been able to take that, and things would kind of have sputtered out. So even, you know, any problem where you get that answer is a nice problem. Um, there are two substitutions left, but we're not going to, to spend three class periods on this. It's a bit, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't say this. Maybe I should try to hype up the material. This does show up in some, like if you're trying to find the area of an ellipse, it shows up. It shows up in some geometric stuff, 
this is not material that I think is we should spend three days on. It shows up, but it's it's not that important. So we'll try to sorry no problem. So we'll try to finish this up tomorrow. And that's very in keeping with what the textbook does, show all the details for the first substitution, show less fewer details for the second substitution, then just kind of wave our hand through the third substitution. 